How's it going, Grey Boys? It is still technically bowl season for us, but we've won our game 31 to 28. Uh, again, a, a walk-off field goal against Minnesota in the Dukes Mayo Bowl. Thankfully, at the time of recording this, uh, I did set the light goal way out of reach. I truthfully didn't want it to be reached. I mean, I set it to a point where if we did reach it, I wouldn't have minded, uh, you know, dunking myself in some mayo. But I'm honestly a little bit relieved. Although, you guys showed some incredible support for that video in the past few videos. So, I want to say thank you for that because uh, it's been an incredible start to the new year for this channel. Now, we have the college football playoff and the offseason to go through today. So, it's pretty much just going to be a menu video. But we can go ahead and just get started on the college football playoff and see what happens. I think that a lot of it was kind of spoiled uh down in the ticker at the bottom of the screen during the last video but uh, i guess we'll get a nice reminder because i think that I, I know a couple of the answers to what happened so we'll start with the one in the eight seed auburn and notre dame playing in the orange bowl we can go ahead and sim this one and it's did i see notre dame winning that no oh okay <laughs> auburn does win it 35 to 26 Notre Dame, they put up a good fight. Uh, we wouldn't have been surprised if they won because it's Notre Dame and uh, NCAA 14. But they do come in as the 8th seed, so you would expect them to lose. Auburn stays undefeated. They're 14-0 after the 35-26 victory. Texas in Purdue. Purdue dominated all year long. Texas with one loss. I'm kind of expecting it to be the Boilermakers, but it is Texas by a touchdown. Oh, that is... Oh, so close. Can we see how it happened? A comeback from Texas in the fourth quarter, including, well, nothing really late in the game. Texas scored first. Purdue took a lead into the half, but then uh, just an empty second half for the Boilermakers means that the Longhorns are able to take that lead. Two, uh, two touchdowns with two-point conversions failed is how they get to 15, but it's enough to prevail. Continuing on, maybe the first of our weird ones is the three seed in Army against the six seed in Florida in the Fiesta Bowl. Uh, you would expect the Gators to win that, and I think they did. 31 to 24. Army was, I don't know, maybe a little bit uh, overrated for the entire season. They tried to mount a little bit of a comeback in the fourth quarter, but that second quarter from Florida was just a little bit too much. We have one game remaining here, and it's another weird one. USC at number five in the country playing a undefeated number four Georgia Southern. And again, I think it was Georgia Southern that played four FCS teams during the regular season. So they really shouldn't have been here and maybe being proven that they don't belong. They put up a good fight, but USC wins it 49 to 28. And the Eagles have their dream season snuffed out like a campfire. Speaking of which, uh, a little friendly reminder, if you don't put out your campfires, I will come and I will find you and I will end you. All right, so now we can set up our semi-final round. So we'll go ahead and load the files in. And with it loaded, uh, there's our uh, semi-final round. Auburn versus USC in the Rose Bowl with Texas versus Florida in the Sugar Bowl. The blood is... Running pretty blue at this stage in the playoffs. And I think just based off of what we've seen, I'm going to predict an Auburn versus Texas final. So we'll start with the Rose Bowl here and see who can hang on. Auburn trying to stay undefeated, trying to prove that they belong at the number one seed. And oh my gosh, I think we are going to be in for a big surprise. A absolute blowout. 41 to 17 USC. Just making a statement there with the big win. I thought that Auburn was going to win because they actually had to play a tough opponent in their quarterfinal matchup, and USC just got to, you know, roll through Georgia Southern. But the Trojans coming out strong, 41 to 17. Is this going to be accurate? It is. They took the lead, held on to it into halftime, and then just blew them away in the second half. So already, uh, I am completely wrong on my prediction for the final. What will we see for the second half? Uh, in the Sugar Bowl, Texas versus Florida. Let's go ahead and sim this one and see. Well, at least I got one of them right. The Longhorns do end up winning it 24 to 10. And I predicted that one for the similar reason as I thought Auburn would win. 
is because Florida in the first round just had to play Army uh, and it wasn't like a huge victory. So just kind of figured that maybe that meant they weren't quite as elite. So Texas, the number seven seed and USC, the number five seed will be playing in a huge rematch in the national championship game. And this one just kind of proving why the playoff should expand from its current format because neither of these two teams would have an opportunity at the title in a four-team playoff. All right, so once again, let's set up our national championship. And at Hard Rock Stadium in Miami, it's going to be Texas versus USC. And I know that USC played in the Rose Bowl, but we have to send them back there, right? A rematch of 2006 has to be played in the same venue. And while maybe it seems a little bit unfair that USC essentially gets two home games, who am I to deny this chance at a historic rematch? So we'll go ahead and save that up and we can scroll down to our national championship matchup. And I think the USC will get the better of the, of the Longhorns this time around. They've done a really good job so far in the playoffs. Uh, Texas has done okay as well, but I just feel like it's going to be the way that I predicted it. And it is 41 to 21. The Trojans are your national champions on this year. They get revenge for 2006. I mean, it's been, gosh, probably close to two decades at this point in this sim, but they're able to upend the Longhorns. The number five seed is your national champions. It would have been nice to have a number seven seed. That's kind of a Cinderella story, although it's still Texas at the end of the day. Uh, Texas, though, officially not back. We can confirm that. USC opened up to a huge lead in the first half and then didn't look back, held on, extended a little bit through the third quarter, but not giving up an inch in the fourth quarter. Texas just unable to get it done. So absolutely huge for the Trojans, who I feel like have done okay in this dynasty, but we haven't seen a Pac-12 team really do all that well. We can finalize this playoff, and with it all said and done, uh, now it's official. USC are the national champions in this season of our dynasty. With that now done, we can advance to the end of the bowl season and see where we're ranked. We are expecting ourselves maybe to jump up closer to the top 10, maybe number 12. Uh, but if USC doesn't catapult themselves all the way to first in every single poll, I'm going to be pretty surprised. Uh, and then we'll take a look to see what the results of the rest of the bowls were. Hey, I guessed it right. We are sitting at number 12 in the country. Minnesota drops down to number 23. And there it is, the real champs. Well, the Trojans are their disputed uh, national champions. But uh, there's really no disputing uh, winning an 18 playoff. They won all three of their matchups. I guess maybe you could dispute their quarterfinal matchup because they played Georgia Southern of all teams. But... To say that that's uh, questionable is odd to me, especially since they're unanimous in the coaches poll. Uh, but, oh, wow, not unanimous in the media poll. Florida, uh, okay, kind of interesting. Didn't make the national championship game. Uh, lost to Auburn in the SEC championship and then lost to Michigan, it says. Did they play Michigan? I don't remember the <laughs> All right, I knew I got confused. <laughs> I had to go take a look because I was just racking my brain. Florida played Army in the first round, uh, but it says that they lost to Michigan. So just the way, again, that the Dynasty tool works with the setting up the playoffs. Uh, just the records might show a little bit weird, but their win-loss is correct. They were 13-2. and two. Uh, Definitely shouldn't have been moved up in the polls at the end of the year, though. Auburn... Deserves still to be above them, I believe. They at least won their first round. Purdue, man, that's arguable. Army should be lower than uh, fifth, but at least they moved. And for us, ending the season 12-2, uh, and two, sitting at number 12 in the country in front of every single other team from the state of Michigan is big. And another big one for us, ending in front of Coastal Carolina, who beat Duke in their bowl game. That's kind of a North Carolina, South Carolina battle right there. 
but let's take a look at the bowl results if they're not just all borked up. Uh, again, I'm just going to kind of scroll through if there's any that are really interesting, like Pitt, who we moved into this bowl so that we could play in the Mayo Bowl, lost 28-10 to 10 to Hawaii, so... Uh, I would say that was kind of fitting. Maybe Hawaii a little bit angry they had to play uh, a 7-5 and five pit. But scrolling through again, um, just interesting to see results every year. Especially, I mean, some of these look like, <laughs> like we have a lot of blowouts. Uh, not a crazy amount of close games, although I say that and we scroll past a ton of really close games. Again, uh, I would love to be able to focus in on every single one of these matchups, but that video would be way too long and sometimes these videos are already too long to begin with so uh unfortunately that's just the way it is michigan did end up losing their bowl game to georgia in the citrus bowl 31 to 17 so i'm curious uh how that all got this is so weird uh again usc looking really good there is coastal they beat duke and attack slayer gator bowl 37 to 17 a nice three score victory for the teal boys but again, for them, they were 10 and 2 going into the game playing a 7 and 5 Duke. So they probably should have won that uh, at least by that much, if not by a little bit more. Um, just so interested to see what we can do next year now as we will be again moving conferences to the Big Ten, but also picking up a lot of new and big recruits and getting a chance to train our guys up. So speaking of that let's go ahead and advance to the end of the season and see what we can get done in our off-season recruiting right now we're just in recruiting battles with two guys um we won coach of the year hey that's pretty big 750 xp alongside it uh that's a lot of xp I, i'm a big fan of that 11 first team all conference players that's pretty awesome uh okay okay the, did we level up oh we are so so close and how about that uh first year we make it to the playoff as the offensive coordinator here at eastern and we go 12 and 3 and the second year as the head coach we don't make it back to the playoff but we get a good bowl win and we do end the season 12 and 2 you know statistically could be considered a better season because we had a, a higher win percentage i think is that how math works 12 wins out of 14 is better than 12 wins out of 15 that, that sounds right to me uh, now our career record as a coach, 82 and 18. We're nearing the 100 win mark. Uh, not this next season, unless we manage to schedule a couple of extra games. But the season after, uh, well, fingers crossed, uh, the terrible things, I guess, could happen. 4-2 against our rivals, 12-2 here at Eastern Michigan. Uh, just because they only credit us for the one year as head coach. But against top 25 opponents, we're 26-8, and eight, which is impressive. And 9-2 and two in bowls. So we have been very, very successful in our bowl games. We have the coaching carousel to go through, but we're just going to advance to the next stage uh, and look at the full results instead of having to sim through that animation every time. And something interesting must have happened. Uh, we have a new really good defensive coordinator but a terrible offensive coordinator. I don't know what that's going to do for us, but I'm curious to see what's happening. We're just going to take a look at head coaching positions for now, and we'll see any any interesting stuff. Bob Diaco replaces Brady Hoke at Akron, which is, I guess, interesting. Ryan Day is new, the new head coach at Boston College. I'm curious. I don't remember where he came from. Uh, Coastal continues to have Jacob Peeler as their head coach. Any other interesting stuff for us? Will Muschamp left uh, Fresno State and was replaced by Mark Stoops. Bodie Reeder, the, the old coach for Indiana. He was one of our coaches at some point. I don't remember where or what position, but he's been fired from Indiana. So that's, well, that's a bit, a bit of a shame. Brett Venables, uh, okay, fired from Kent State and they hired Greg Schiano to replace him. What else do we have going on? Manny Diaz finally gets fired from Miami. There's a lot of uh, firings. New coach, Jason Candle. I want to say that's another uh, one of our old head coaches. He is now the head coach at Mizzou. At Ohio State, uh, Kalani Satake has been fired, and they brought in Will Muschamp, of all coaches. Kind of interesting. He's 5-5 five and five in bowls and 18-42 and 42 against the top 25. But Ohio State, who has struggled mightily in our dynasty, 
has decided that he's the man to get the job done. That's uh, that's a controversial decision. As far as the rest of the head coaches, uh, pretty much everybody just seems like they're uh, getting extensions. I guess uh, we could take a look at some other stuff. Jimbo Fisher is the new offensive coordinator at Army. So they pick up, I, I guess, a pretty solid uh, guy there. Where is, uh, where's our coach? <laughs> Who do we have coaching for us now on the offensive side of the ball that has no experience? I'm assuming that our previous guy has gone somewhere else as, uh, you know, zero, zero level ups is, is pretty frustrating or scary. Or maybe that just means that he didn't move at all. I realize now that I've just scrolled past it. For some reason in my mind, uh, the team name thing wasn't alphabetical. Uh, anyways, John Arnold, we keep him. So we do keep our offensive coordinator, uh, which honestly is <laughs> not as good as it could have been. I, I was kind of hoping we would get somebody new. Uh, not terrible. Uh, definitely not great, though. How about the defensive coordinator? Uh, this one could be interesting. And uh, now that I know where we're looking, we can get there pretty easy. We got Brent Venables. <laughs> What an absolutely insane hire. Jeff Schmetting is gone. He's in a new job. <laughs> and we pull in Brent Venables. Uh, okay, the defense. We will be expecting them to put up some numbers uh, this year. They were first in the MAC this past year and 11th in the country. We're moving to the Big Ten. So if we can have the number one the defense in the Big Ten, we will be a force to be reckoned with. Well, let's uh, do some level ups. We want to do our levels. It's really weird that it reset it to me, uh, but it is what it is. So we'll just uh, get all of our stuff put in here again. Make sure that we max our letter of intent a little bit and then get our one level into the insta commit. I think I'm going to keep the locksmith and the pipelines low for now because I do like having uh, some stuff uh in the game management skill tree uh let's do something like that cpu doesn't make false starts that that would be pretty nice so john arnold still just level three as the offensive coordinator but then brent venables we can just uh kind of spam the a button here because we get every single level up possible which is going to give our defense such a huge edge that they didn't have last year the new freshmen coming into play are gonna have uh, a great time. And actually, this is the sort of thing that with the Dynasty tool that the revamp team put out, this actually does make a difference in the offseason training. So speaking of the tool, we'll load it up here and start to work with it because uh, we have two things we can do, really. The, the draft declaration, the players leaving stage, essentially, and the training results stage. So we'll start with the players leaving stage and we'll see if anybody's going to transfer away or declare for the nfl for some reason and well things are going to be interesting a lot of graduations we do have carl taylor the 65 overall center transferring due to playing time gonna be honest don't care uh didn't ask plus ratio sorry carl <laughs> i hope you have fun wherever you end up but you are just not good enough for a team with the prestige of the Eastern Michigan Eagles. 18 guys leaving, none of them going to the draft. The best player, Corey Poole, uh, at 82 overall. Uh, we're losing a lot of secondary players and a lot of linemen is what I'm seeing. Uh, so that's going to make things a little bit interesting. But again, I mean, sh that's pretty much everything. Linemen, secondary players, there's really no skill positions. So if we can kind of reload at the line... Our offense should be pretty solid. Like, like we didn't lose a wide receiver. We didn't lose a running back. This could be impressive. Now, I could try to convince Carl to stick around. He wants to go play at Temple. Uh, he's from Rhode Island. I don't know. That lets him get a little bit closer to home. Maybe he actually gets to see the field. So we're not going to step in his way. Carl, best of luck to you. Uh, you just better hope that we don't come up and decide to play Temple. Let's go ahead and advance to the transfer request. See if uh, we can get anybody to come play for us. Tommy Norton, the 53 overall free safety from Stanford. Listen, uh, Tommy, you seem like a good kid. You're from Michigan, uh, Warren, Michigan. I want to say that's like the Detroit area. I'm pretty sure there's like a big like Warren Street or Warren Road running through Detroit that's like super long. So that's my guess as to where this city is. But 
Unfortunately, Tommy, stay at Stanford. You're getting an incredible education. You're not a good football player. Why would you leave Stanford to go play anywhere else? The only thing else is like some other Ivy League school, maybe? But my guy, you're not coming to Eastern Michigan. I'm doing this for your own good. Let's go ahead and advance. Let's get to this recruiting stage. We'll see who we can pull in. Uh, you know, as long as they're not 53 overall, they'll probably be pretty solid. We're in two recruiting battles currently. A 78 overall wide receiver in Chris Whitaker and a 67 overall corner in Cliff Reed. Uh, we have signed 14 guys, I think. We have eight scholarships remaining. The math on that says 17. Again, two five stars three four stars and eight three stars is pretty solid i think the two is in the ones are like juco guys we're sitting with a top 10 class at the moment so now that we put brent venables on the staff i'm curious if we can pull in any other big names and i'm just gonna go through and see uh if there's any players that haven't committed anywhere else uh <laughs> that maybe they like us a little bit like here we're 14,000 behind Akron. We're not going to get him, but I might add a couple of guys to the board that we have some small chance at getting. All right, so I added six guys onto the board. Uh, most of them not great, but the number three kicker in the country just has us as his number one. So I will offer a scholarship to him. We'll scout these the guys that I decide to offer. Everybody else, uh, I mean, I guess maybe we should scout them first. Some of these guys we have scouted. Uh, <laughs> Uh, who would have thought? Anyways, Freddie Holland is an 84 overall, uh, number three kicker in the country. He's 86 overall, and he likes us. 95 on the kick accuracy, which is kind of a shame. You would prefer the kick power over the kick accuracy, but I would be a fool not to recruit an 86 overall kid, right? How about Justin Washington? 65 overall corner. He goes up to a 67. He looks very mediocre, but you put him on the roster. Maybe his redshirt senior season comes around. And he can play uh, somewhere on the two deep or the three deep. Who knows? How about Brandon McCallow? He's going to have to be even better. Not quite. He goes up to a 66 overall. And again, he looks worse. His man coverage is pretty rough. But if we can get him to commit and we don't have to worry about losing out on committing better players, it'd be better to pick up the full class than, uh, than to leave spots open. All right, so on our board, Freddie Holland has become a pretty high uh, target for us. We just didn't realize that he existed for a while. Maybe he finally sent a tape to us. Or actually, I feel like uh, whatever he was sending us, if we're number one on his board, he wanted to play here. He's from Carbondale, Pennsylvania. I got to imagine that all the recruiting footage that he kept trying to send to us was just getting stuck in the spam folder. Finally had an intern check it, and so we were like, oh, yeah. This kid's actually pretty solid. So tentatively, we'll throw 2,000 points his way. Uh, we don't necessarily need a kicker, but how can you turn down a guy that's 86 overall as a freshman? That's pretty solid. 99 overall kicker is always going to be useful. Chris Whitaker is going to get a ton of points. 78 overall athlete. We're only 1,000 in front of Akron, and certainly... We would expect them to just throw the kitchen sink at this kid. So we're going to do the same. Number 10 athlete in the country. Another five star that would put us up to three five stars in the class. So honestly, Chris Whitaker is probably going to get almost every single point available. In fact, instead of going up to 12-8 or whatever number we're going to choose, we should go to the top and go down. And I'm just going to tentatively put him at 9,000 for now. And we'll see if that's okay. Scrolling down from Chris... We do have a couple of guys that would be nice to get. Uh, but once you get down to like Brant Jean and Dallas Miller, do they matter that much? And already we're kind of expecting them to commit anyways. We're, we're in the lead with a lot of these guys. Jason Green would be nice to pick up as well. I think maybe we go 1,500 each or maybe 2,000 each. 1,750 is the number I'm going to land on. Final offer. So that just leaves us with 7,500 on Chris Whitaker, which should be enough. But again, I always like to just absolutely go all in on a guy. And then the rest of these guys, 1,750. Have the other teams offered him a scholarship? No, no, and no. Well, that makes me feel pretty comfortable. Uh, we have not offered scholarships pretty much to anybody else on the board. Uh, and we're not really in the lead with anybody on the board. So... I'm going to call it good. I, I, we're not 
necessarily going to sign a full class. I mean, actually, we're at 17. We sign one, two, three, four, five guys, and then three other guys down from the bottom of the board. We might actually get ourselves a full class. Of course, there's no guarantee that we do pick these guys up. So we'll advance to the next si stage into National Signing Day. And we'll see where our class comes out ranked. Uh, can we stay in that top 10? We do level up finally. So that must mean that we got at least a couple guys committed. Oh boy. Chris Whitaker, the wide receiver comes. So does Jason Green, Dallas Miller, and Colvin Stover. So we don't get Brant Jean and we didn't get the kicker either. Uh, he's not showing up. You know what? That kicker probably decided not to commit anywhere. Top class in the conference. Top 10 in the nation. And we added a five star, a four star, and a three star on the day. So, uh, signed 21 players could have been a little bit better. I'm curious. Ben Humphrey? No. Where's our guy? Brant Jean went to Ole Miss. Freddie Holland just didn't really feel like anybody wanted him enough. So, he decides not to commit anywhere. I guess he'll walk on somewhere. You would think maybe he would walk on with us. Uh, <laughs> you never know. Maybe he will. How about our recruiting class? We knew, we know we're top 10. We jump up to number nine. That's pretty good for us. Three five stars, four four stars, and nine three stars. In terms of five stars, only three teams did better than us. Two of them were in the playoffs, and the other one is Oklahoma. The Sooners had a seven and six year, but if you're a really talented kid, you're probably thinking, okay, that's a one-off for Oklahoma, and now I can come in and get an early starting spot on a big team. So I guess that's not too surprising. Teal Boys pulled in two guys as well, two five stars but only a, the number 52 class in the nation. And how about some weird ones picking up five stars? Utah State grabbed one. Mm, anything else? Illinois is a little bit interesting. Houston, Georgia Tech, Colorado State all getting a five star. And then there's Alabama. <laughs> Alabama using the name recognition to get the number eight class in the country after they went seven and six. Okay, well, with such a good class, uh, and actually we have a level up that we can do here. Well, just while I'm thinking about it, let's finish off the Road Warrior, or should we go matchup? I actually do like the matchup, helping me find the best mismatch. Miss match. Miss Mitch match? Something like that. That's always uh, a little bit useful. Just makes things a touch easier uh, in-game. So, again, we'll advance to that position, change, and we'll see where we can move something. We got a lot of athletes this year, so we're going to have a lot of moving to do here six five guys to figure out where they're gonna go and they are all so good to begin with all right so i did go through and look uh our offensive line we have almost no players the defensive line we're pretty stacked our corners are okay we don't really have a lot of safeties uh we need a new uh, new quarterback because albert's a 73 uh, he could get up into the 80s with a ridiculous offseason, but we won't expect it. And then running-wise, we could probably use a new player for that as well. Now, Brandon Lane is a pretty solid running back, but a really good wide receiver. 80 overall at the wide receiver, but it, we're decent on our depth at our wide receiver, and he can play the safety position or corner. So we're going to hold off there. Maurice Tate uh, is also a decent safety, but he has quarterback written all over him. If we look, 90 throw power, 81 throw accuracy. So maybe not the most accurate, but if he can throw long bombs, that's what I've been looking for. Uh, and he's decently quick as well. 81 speed, 83 acceleration. So uh, that's who we're going to go with as our quarterback, I think. Maurice Tate will move him into the QB slot, although... We could have a couple other guys, so we'll see, again, where some of these other guys jump out. Okay, I think I've figured it out. So, Brandon Lane, we're going to move to the wide receiver spot. Uh, we will have Dallas... No, uh, not Dallas Miller. We will have Derek Bentley move to be a running back. And then Dallas Miller is going to become a free safety, as I think so will Chris Whitaker. He's an 80 overall free safety or 78 overall corner, but we're going to put him at the free safety spot. Uh, actually, we might need to move one of them to strong safety because we have, uh, you know, some stuff going on there. 80, 75, 71, but at the free safety, it's down at a 67. And Dallas being the stronger of the two, we're going to move him to the strong safety uh, we'll get a walk on on both spots. Our two deep isn't very good at the safety spot, but it's okay in general. 
looking solid for corners. The linebackers, maybe we could use one. In fact, I'm going to have to move one of these left or right guys to the middle. And in that spot, we're going to put uh, Jonathan Lewis. So Jonathan Lewis will be our new starting middle linebacker. And we can move one of these guys out to the left. And that's what it will look like. Uh, so <laughs> a little bit confusing. Once we get to the depth chart, it'll make a whole lot more sense. First, though, it's time for the training results. We'll load this up and then we will load it in to the dynasty tool. And I'm always so excited for this part because it's such a cool way of doing things. And okay, Durham Finch Jr. goes up plus seven to be the best player on the roster. Uh, that's bad news for Albert because I don't see his name very high up. He was a 73 overall and he did not break. Uh, well, he might be 77, but it's, it's not looking good. So again, all the numbers, uh, and letter grades that you see are used in a formula to determine, uh, how much or how good of a chance your ha players have to either progress or regress in their attributes. So with uh, Eastern Michigan right now, we're at a C minus in the academics, a D plus in the facilities and a D plus in pro potential. But as a head coach, your boys got a 99. Our offensive coordinator is a 52. And even though we brought in Brent Venables, we get a 37 for the defensive coordinator. But either way, maybe Brent Venables just doesn't have good prestige as a coordinator. So we did have guys go down. Marcus Brown, our senior center, goes down to a 79, which kind of sucks. And then, oh, Sean Mitchell, the wide receiver, had a good year, but he drops four overall to a 72 going into his senior year. That is really, really disappointing. And Luke Clark, our kicker, actually went down three. So missing out on the, uh, the really good kicker could end up biting us in the back. Uh, otherwise, I'm seeing a decent amount of plus sevens. So that's nice. The The other kicker, Kyle Harris, goes down minus two, as does another center and our right end, Teddy Wilson. I didn't see what Albert did. Albert went up plus three to a 76, which I guess isn't terrible, but is almost certainly not going to be enough to get the starting spot back. Uh, where is throw power and throw accuracy? There it is. So he goes up to 77. He stays at 77 throw power. And goes up to 80 throw accuracy. So even the freshman that we're bringing in, even though he's not the most accurate, he's more accurate than Albert. And he has an absolute cannon of an arm. So I just don't see a reason why we would start Albert. Kind of a shame. And if this was the modern era, you would not be surprised to see him enter the transfer portal. We had three players go up that plus seven. Durham Finch, Leon Logan, and Brian Valentine. And our biggest uh, regressions, oh, that's pretty rough. So Sean Mitchell, Luke Clark, Teddy Wilson, Kyle Harris, Jermaine Richardson, and Marcus Brown all went down. And then we had four players not move uh, an inch, which kind of sucks to see Avery Rawls stay at a 77 because I was expecting him to do pretty big things this upcoming season. So with our training done, let's go ahead and figure out what players that we're going to cut. As I say that, I'm not sure if we actually will have any. We lost a lot of players. It can't be that many. Oh, seven. Maybe we picked up some walk-ons that I wasn't aware of. So right away, let's just go cut some of the uh, the bad players if we're able to. Uh, our position depth kind of hurts us in a few spots. But like Nate Wilson, this uh, freshman walk-on is going to have to go. Especially we have so many players from Ohio. It's not like it even matters for the pipeline. How about Gilbert Morgan? Get rid of the strong safety from Alabama. Uh, we'd have to keep Nick Allen, though. So five more players to cut. Teddy Wilson, he had a rough time. I think he went down four overall in the offseason. Uh, the right end, we have a ton of end depth. He's just not going to make it. So even though he's from Michigan, he's unfortunately not going to stay on the team. I will keep Steve Vincent around. Now, we just recruited him as a fullback, and a 60 overall fullback is not bad. But Nick McLean, the quarterback, well, he can hit the road as well. Joe Rivero, I'm going to keep around for now as we scroll through and just look to see if there's anything else that's really bad. Um, Kyle Harris is gone. I don't see a reason to keep him around. He's not going to do much for us. And other than that, well, I guess, yeah, we'll just trim the fat at the very bottom because... Uh, what are these guys actually going to do? Joe Rivero, even if he is going to somehow find the field at some point, I'd rather have a tired 70-plus overall than a fresh-legged 62. Same thing for Jermaine Robinson. Robertson. 
And now the tough one, Lorenzo Pope. We just recruited him. I don't think I can get rid of him since he's a freshman. So maybe we find a really bad senior like Ryan Thomas. And actually, no, he, he's lucky. I almost cut him. We're already at 70 overall, so he'll get to survive and finish out his, uh, his career here at Eastern Michigan on what I'm expecting to be a pretty solid team. Uh, now, let's go to the fun part. Custom conference time. All right, so here's what we're doing. We're moving to the Big Ten. Uh, and I'm going to be honest, I have not yet decided what team we're going to replace. So we're going to figure it out together live. Well, there's only one option, right? It's got to be Rutgers. I feel really bad for the Scarlet Knights. I don't even think they've done all that bad necessarily. But seeing as we are Eastern Michigan and the other two Michigan divisions are in the Eastern Division. And Rutgers is in New Jersey, which really isn't all that far east. Oh, we're going to replace them. So that is uh, the new Big Ten. Three teams from Michigan. And we've already beaten both of them, I think. And for sure, we're going to try and run the table. Uh, I'm just kind of hoping that our conference schedule doesn't match us up against Minnesota because, well, we don't want to face some uh, angry gophers. All right. Well, that's it for the offseason. We'll advance to the preseason here. And I am going to save pretty much all of this for the start of our next season. We'll decide who to redshirt and who will be playing uh, at the start of the next episode. So I guess we can take a look. They've scheduled us against Army on the road, and then we have to play Minnesota the second week of the season. That's like worst case scenario. Uh, but then Florida Atlantic is a road game. I am more than willing to change that up. In fact, uh, we are most likely going to be removing one of these. We are scheduled right now to play number one Florida. I'm not against playing Florida, but we're not doing it in that bye week. We don't do week one buys here. So I'll just go ahead and scroll through. If you guys want, we could still play Florida. But in the comments, I want to see who you guys want us to play. If you guys overwhelmingly say play an FCS team, we will do it. But this is the list. So uh, write your comment or if somebody else has already said it, you know, leave a thumbs up on their comment as well. That's our week one matchup or week two matchup. I'm much likely going to continue to play Army. Uh, I'm definitely not going to play Auburn if we play Florida. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I'm keeping Army. Uh, Georgia Tech, not quite. I just have to prove that uh, we're better than Army since they made the playoffs as a three seed last year. This Florida Atlantic game, though, our final out of conference game. You guys can fully choose again who we play and whether or not we're on the road. Maybe we do like a Chick-fil-A kickoff or something. Um, that's going to be up to you guys to decide, though. Uh, as Again, there's a lot of options for this opponent. So I'll just kind of shut my mouth for a second and scroll through here. My goodness. Yeah, okay, good luck. Good luck all reaching a consensus on who we can play. I might just pick the one person who suggests something that I already want to play, uh, and then we'll go with them. And I think right now this is actually confirming that we're not ranked, which pisses me off because that is two seasons in a row. We have done really well. We even won a bowl game last year, and we have a better team returning with a better coaching staff, but they disrespect us right off the bat. So unfortunately, that's going to have to do it for this episode. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And again, leave a comment with the team you want us to play, uh, whether on the road or at home or at a neutral site. And uh, also what week we would be playing them in. And we will determine all that at the start of the next episode. If you did enjoy this video, please feel free to leave a like. Uh, you've already commented, so subscribe if you haven't done that already. That way you can get notifications for when new videos comes out. And you know, it's another easy way to support the channel. If you want to go beyond that, though, uh, maybe consider becoming a channel member. Uh, most likely one of the players that we just recruited is going to have their name changed because channel members once a season can pick a recruit uh, and change the name of that either to themselves like a few of our guys have been so far or maybe something a little bit funny or just like the name that you always choose for sports games like for me i don't know why i don't know where the name came from but in any sports game where i can change my name if i'm not doing it for youtube purposes my name has always just been ralph daniels 
I wish I had an answer for why that is, but uh, I have no idea. If that interests you, again, think about becoming a channel member. And then once you've done all of the above, uh, head down to the description where you can find links to my Twitch at twitch.tv slash goonmaster. It's also links to my Twitter, uh, our community Discord, and of course, the college football revamped mod if you're trying to get it for yourself. All that being said, though, thank you guys so much for watching. My name is Goonmaster. You guys are the Gray Boys, and wherever you are, have a good night or have a good morning. And we'll see you later. Adios.